Since starting this channel, the support has been incredible. I've heard from a lot of people offering words of extraordinary kindness and encouragement, which I really appreciate. People have also got in touch to ask me quite a lot of questions, which I do my best to answer, but I'm not always able to answer fully. So I thought it'd be nice to make a dedicated space for this here. Thanks so much to everyone who got in touch to ask a question. It really means a lot to me. I received far more questions than I was expecting, so I've picked around 10 to respond to here over the course of two videos. This is part one. I hope you enjoy it. I love this question in particular because I've been thinking about it a lot in relation to the city where I live, Warsaw. I would like eventually to make a video dedicated to this. For me, a city only really acquires a sense of reality when it has been reconstructed in words. When you read about a city you know and walk its streets, its double, the city of words, pulses within its bricks and mortar like a second heart. When you read about a city you don't know, you have already, in a sense, acquired something of its essence. I've never visited Drachobrz, for instance, but it lives intimately within me through the work of Bruno Schulz. I've never been to Dublin, but I'm acquainted with its soundscape, its sights and smells, which move like a current within me because of my reading of James Joyce. I'll try to answer the question in three ways. I'll pick a real city, a fantastical city, and then one that exists somewhere between the two. Although I don't generally like such distinctions because for me, all three cities are rooted in the imagination. But I thought it's a nice way to answer the question. So for my real city, I'll pick the Bangalore of Jayaprakash Satyamurthy's Come Tomorrow, which is a collection of beautifully written ghost stories, all of which possess a kind of quiet melancholy. Now they owe something to the tradition of the weird tale, perhaps in the mode of someone like Robert Aikman, but they also draw very heavily on Indian religions and folklore. My reason for including the book here, though, is that the city of Bangalore plays a central role in each of these stories. Satyamurthy is hyper-conscious of the permeable border between city and psyche, between external and internal states, and of the ways in which urban spaces and atmospheres can sculpt and shape the perception as well as the identity of those who exist within them. The city at times also takes on the dimensions of cosmic horror, as in the story Dancer of the Dying, in which Satyamurthy writes, the city is not what you think it is. Your city is a skin, a film, a layer of detritus on the surface of something whose scale utterly dwarfs you. For my fantastical city, I would have to pick Bologna from Samuel R. Delaney's Dahlgren. If you'd like to hear a more involved discussion of that book, we talked about it on episode 28 of Sherd's podcast. But what I like most about this city of words is its amorphous quality. Bologna is a city in which nothing appears to be permanent. Its spatial organization, the flow of time within it, the forces that push for control of it. Each of these elements seems to be in a state of flux, as impermanent as the shifting skies above it, which now flare with a distant supernova, and now cradle in their depths a pair of moons. All that seems permanent about it, ultimately, is a feeling of slow, painful entropy that for some, such as Joseph Weidman, who claimed that Bologna could be substituted for Detroit, St. Louis, Milwaukee, echoes the plight of American cities left to rot, abandoned to poverty, and allowed to enter a protracted state of erosion and decay. After all, the book, in its opening sentence, refers to Bologna as the autumnal city, that is, a city on the cusp of a long darkness, but which, as it fades and dies, explodes into glorious color. 
For my city that exists between fantasy and reality, I'll pick the London of J.G. Ballard's The Drowned World. While not a flawless novel by any stretch of the imagination, it's worth reading alone for its ideas, but for me, most of all because of its reimagining of my native city of London. In The Drowned World, the Earth's ionosphere has deteriorated and global temperatures have risen enormously. While much of the urban populations of the world have fled to the poles, botanical life is thriving. London has flooded, and archaic forms of giant tropical life have re-emerged to shroud the tower blocks and coil over the capital's monumental buildings. What emerges for me is the idea of the city as organism, bound up in grotesque symbiosis with natural forms. In writing about this, Ballard essentially invents the aesthetics of the post-apocalypse that will run through the genre, not only in the decades that follow, but even up to today. A bird's eye view description of the city gives a sense of the extremity of the transformation. Like an immense putrescent saw, the jungle lay exposed below the open hatchway of the helicopter. Giant groves of gymnosperms stretched in dense clumps along the rooftops of the submerged buildings, smothering the white rectangular outlines. Here and there an old concrete water tower protruded from the morass, or the remains of a makeshift jetty still floated beside the hulk of a collapsing office block, overgrown with feathery acacias and flowering tamarisks. Everywhere the silt encroached, shoring itself in huge banks against a railway viaduct or crescent of offices, oozing through a submerged arcade like the fetid contents of some latter-day cloaca maxima. Many of the smaller lakes were now filled by the silt, yellow disks of fungus-covered sludge from which a profuse tangle of competing plant forms emerged, walled gardens and an insane Eden. Ballard is also acutely aware of this interplay between inner life and environment. But one of the most captivating aspects of the novel is the idea that as archaic forms of vegetation re-emerge, so too do the atavistic drives that have been suppressed in humanity for eons. We watch humanity drift back through the temporal marshes of millennia to be drawn once again to the habitat of its genetic forebears. We watch as the desire for the primordial swamp grows and grows. Surprisingly few people have ever asked me about the name of the podcast or the channel so I guess it must be at least to some degree self-explanatory, but perhaps not. When Rob and I started the podcast, the idea behind it was to enact a kind of literary unearthing or exhumation, to find works that had been forgotten or overlooked or buried beneath the weight and ubiquity of mainstream literary culture. Since this was the thought, I opted for an archeological metaphor a sherd is another term for a pot sherd or a broken pottery fragment, especially one of archaeological value, hence the name Sherd's Podcast and Sherd's Tube. I was also under the influence of the folk horror TV play Robin Redbreast from 1970, which contains this marvellous fragment that features at the beginning of the podcasts. I wonder if I might hunt for sherds in your garden. What? One often finds them, you know, in freshly turned earth. Shirts? Well, I have an archaeological interest. I'm a student of that, in my own time. Old things, generally. The focus of the channel has shifted away slightly from this purely archaeological endeavour, but it remains dear to my heart, and it still guides my reading, perhaps more than anything else. So this is the question I received most often. I loved making Sherd's podcast and I know that many of you are eager for it to return. 
And what I loved about it most of all probably was speaking to my friend Rob on a subject that we both care about deeply. And it also gave us the opportunity to explore books at greater length and perhaps in more depth than I'm able to achieve here on YouTube. We initially stopped as Rob had far less time to devote to it after the birth of his daughter. Since beginning the channel, however, I've found that the process of making videos is far more satisfying for me artistically. The writing and editing process I would liken to making music, this feeling of malleability, a focus on rhythm, building layers upon layers, shaping something organically. Making the podcast is far more repetitive in terms of the labor required. We would often end up with over two hours of audio at which I would painstakingly chip away until it began to resemble something pleasing to listen to. And this could take up to 12 hours or more per episode. As much as I enjoyed the recording of the conversations, making the music, I never really enjoyed the editing process until the final moments towards an episode's completion. Of course, I'm open to making more at some point in the future, but for now I'm far more interested in making videos and trying to bring my own style to this medium. I have to admit that most of the writers I read are no longer living, but I do think it's crucial to support living authors and there are a few whose work I try to follow very, very closely. I won't spend too much time on the bigger names who are important to me, but I should mention Thomas Ligotti, whom I've spoken about at length on the channel, Cynthia Ozick, whose essays and short stories I admire very much, and John Banville, whose early work made a particular impression on me in my early 20s. For now, I'll focus on those writers whose work doesn't receive quite the attention that it should. And for me, the writer whose work I look forward to most eagerly is undoubtedly Justin Isis. His two major collections, published by the late great Chormu Press, I Wonder What Human Flesh Tastes Like from 2011 and Welcome to the Arms Race from 2015, contain some of the most exciting contemporary writing that I've encountered. The two collections are quite different from one another. The first, the author refers to as a cubist novel. Ideas, figures and motifs recur throughout the stories, but it's primarily their mood of dissociative urban melancholy and their shared setting of contemporary Tokyo that makes their cumulative effect so overwhelming. Welcome to the Arms Race, whilst it retains a similar stylistic elegance, is an entirely different collection. Although it transcends these genres, it feels rooted in new wave science fiction and cyberpunk, and is more chaotic, unruly, and overtly experimental. There are moments when the text ruptures into a neon psychedelic lyricism. There's even a story in there that feels like the literary equivalent of the Mega Drive game Toe Jam and Earl, filtered through the prism of a Sun Ra record. Beyond this, Justin Isis has also been a prolific editor of anthologies and a writer of poetry and manifestos, and is one of the main figures in the literary movement Neo-Decadence, which I aim to discuss at length in a future video. What excites me most about him is his ambition to transform the literary landscape, to declare aesthetic war on contemporary mainstream literary culture. His outlook would appear confrontational to many, but his way of thinking about literature is so excitingly unconventional that it often provokes me to reassess things that I've taken for granted. I've mentioned it before, but the anthology Neo-Decadence, Twelve Manifestos, though it goes far beyond a consideration of literature alone, is in my view an essential document for anyone who is generally dissatisfied with what is unquestioningly lauded as important work in mainstream publishing. 
While on the subject of neo-decadent writing, I've been enjoying very much recently the work of Brendan Connell, who I believe I'm right in saying is the founder of the movement. I've been reading through his published work lately and I've found it extraordinarily impressive. He draws more heavily on the original decadence than does Justin Isis, but he has an enormous range of his own. Connell seems to be inordinately fond of lists, of a piling up of imagery, which is in keeping for me with one of the major themes of his work, that is, excess. Excess in reference to art, to food, to sex, flesh, slaughter. His work often takes a single idea to its most grotesque extreme. For instance, in the story from Unpleasant Tales, a young cellist encounters a master luthier whose prowess in making unique, beautiful instruments from exotic materials grows more and more outlandish until it transpires that he's constructing them from animals that must be kept alive in order to produce the finest timbre. The story only grows more grotesque from that point onwards. But there is also much that is far more subtle in his work and for me, it is the arch beauty of his prose that makes him particularly worth reading. There are two more writers whose work I'll be discussing at greater length in part two of the Q&A, but I wanted to mention them here in any case, and that's Quentin S. Crisp and Violetta Grzegorzewska. Both of their work has become extraordinarily important to me. And finally, I would mention also Rebecca Granston, and in particular her novella, Sea of Glass, and the work of Daniel Mills, whose novel, Revenant, and his collection, Among the Lilies, were both really powerful experiences for me. For my final main choice, though, I would direct people's attention to the writer New Juche. I've only read a few of his books, namely Mountainhead, Boson, and The Worm, but each of them has left a kind of viscous, reeking residue on my mind and I haven't been able to shake them since I read them. The first thing to say about New Juche, I suppose, is that reading his work feels dangerous. It's more than just unsettling. There's a palpable feeling of unease as you accompany the author into more and more sinister regions of depravity. Yet the violent beauty of his prose compels you to follow him. Mountainhead, especially as the first of his books I encountered, was a particularly astounding reading experience for me. Apparently a work of introspective travel writing that charts the author's experiences in Bangkok and later in the north of Thailand. These range from the grimiest, most sordid sexual encounters described in prose that fairly oozes bodily fluids, to the heights of spiritual ecstasy that feel almost Wordsworthian in their evocation of communion with nature. This kind of transcendent lyricism appeals to me enormously, and to find it paired with a kind of viciousness and an overtly peripheral sense of morality makes for a truly unique reading experience but not one that I would recommend to everyone, only if you happen to have a particularly strong stomach. I'll leave you with those caveats and move on. Strangely enough, I read very few books that were written specifically for children. I was encouraged endlessly to read as a young person, but it was quite a challenge for my parents to get me to actually do it. Our home contained many books, and from the moment I turned nine, my mum was pushing me to read Wuthering Heights. But upon reading the first paragraph and being perturbed by the apparent lack of tangerine moonscapes, malfunctioning airlocks, and ennui-filled cyborgs, I quickly abandoned it. It was instead my dad's science fiction novels, usually paperbacks printed in the 1970s with extraordinary lurid covers that drew me in. 
Novels with names like The Death Worms of Kratos or The Winds of Gath. E.C. Tubbs' books in the Doomerist saga were particularly important to me. Often I would not even read these books, but just spend hours looking at their opalescent covers and inventing stories in my mind in response to them. I can give honourable mention to Ted Hughes's The Iron Man, which I know was a big one for you too, Kevin. But if I had to pick one particular book, it would probably be a, another one that my dad handed me and that's George R. R. Martin's Dying of the Light. As a child, something in me really responded to the book's pervading sense of melancholy, the idea of a rogue planet in a slowly decaying orbit, drifting away from its final sun, the cities falling to ruin and darkness. There's a city in the novel built into a windswept valley, a city whose white towers which rise wraith-like towards the stars are formed in such a way that the wind plays the whole construction like an instrument. It plays the same mournful song endlessly, the same dark symphony of the void of starless nights and troubled dreams for eternity. I remember finding this idea enormously poetic as a child I read the book again around five years ago and still found a lot to enjoy about it. Thanks again to everyone who submitted questions. I'll be back soon with part two of the Q&A. If I didn't answer your question, it's only because I didn't want the video to go on forever and I'm sure nobody would want that. If you enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing to the channel. It really means a lot to me. Thanks ever so much for watching and I'll see you next time.